The American dream tells us that regardless of your demographic or circumstances in society, you too can in fact bring yourself to a better place and make improve your life on the merits of your work. We would tell you that this means that when people like even Barack Obama use this kind of rhetoric in order to, uh, to say that when you have a system which does in fact sometimes structurally disadvantage people, that that is something which is a problem because it violates the American dream. We would tell you that this undermines both political parties and the entire political ideology of America, that this is something which is central to us, which is something which is fundamental. They would have to tell you on side opposition for why this shouldn't be uh, part of the national uh, discourse in the way that it is. They would have to show you why some other sort of rhetorical underpinning of a country would be something which is better, something which makes you uh, have like, better outcomes for individuals and society at large. We're going to bring you two arguments to that effect. The first one is about the message to the individuals. The second one is about the message to society. So first, talking about the message to, the indi to individuals. We would tell you that even if this is a lie, this is an incredibly useful lie. Because while it's true that working hard might not always fix everything, it sure as hell doesn't hurt. That individuals who do, in fact, what they like, are in particular positions, it is always better to be working hard at making yourself and the lives of your children and everyone around you better than it is to decide that you are in this hopeless state. And even if you go into a test where you aren't prepared for the test, you're going to do better on that test if you think that there's a possibility that you can succeed. This is the rhetoric that it tells to individuals within the society that it is something that they can achieve, something that they can get better at, and something that they can, in fact, strive for. That kind of an optimism makes it such that people like work hard and and in fact believe that they can succeed moving forward, which keeps you looking for the job when you're in the recession, which keeps you realizing that you can go and get a, get a degree and that you can succeed and then do good things with that once you have that. These are the kinds of, this is the kind of rhetoric which makes people change their individual lives and position them for the best way of success, which if you believe in anything about capitalism, you believe is the best way to move markets forward and to make individuals all over get in fact much better positions. But the second thing we would tell you is that this is also incredibly important when people feel as if the dream has failed them, that this is a perfect example of when people can in fact agitate for change on a very individual level. And we would tell you that agitating for change and creating change can happen on a number of levels, but on an individual level is particularly important. No thank you. We would tell you that this is particularly important because oftentimes the structures that oppress people are happening on very micro scales. They're not massive government policies that need to be changed. Rather, they're oftentimes things like town zoning policies or like the nuances of school funding and things which discriminate against people on very subtle levels that you can see on an individual level that's much harder to see on a, on a structural level across the entire society about that. So would you say that the only way to convince people that equality is good is by putting the burden on the oppressed to fix the conditions of their oppression? Look, so we think a number of things. We're going to talk to you about how this like changes the way that people see individuals. I think people aren't stupid and people don't necessarily, like, yes, some people do think that, oh, it's just the role of the people who are poor to make themselves better. But we can also recognize that when this is the philosophical underpinning of the society, we can also recognize when it goes wrong. That's one of the huge awakenings that's happening in America right now as statistics come out to say that this is something which we are not fulfilling, that this is a promise that we made to people that we are not coming through on, and that's a problem. We think those kinds of, that kind of rhetoric and that kind of change can also happen on a systemic level, but on an individual level, that's incredibly important. For example, when Wall Street crashed the economy and people saw that it was and it's basically a society run by elites for the benefit of elites, and people decided to come out for Occupy Wall Street and other things in order to create the kind of change which they thought would be better for themselves and make it such that they can fight for themselves in a better way. These kinds of things do not and cannot happen in a world in which people take a fatalistic approach that we need, like this that we cannot be successful on our own merits that we cannot be successful in a uh, we cannot be successful um uh, on our own hard work. We think it's a combination of those things that we can both work for it and recognize when there are problems with it. We think people can take a more nuanced approach than, well, it's just like we have to get ourselves out of it. The third thing we would tell you is that this also changes the way that people think about their children and the way that they invest in their children, especially in immigrant communities where education becomes something which is incredibly important. People recognize that even if they can't necessarily get the kind of success they want for themselves, that if they can position their children in such a place that they can find that success, that their children can then go and be successful and get all the things that they want, uh, making this makes it such that you stay up later trying to earn bills to pay for the college tuition. Whatever it happens to be, you support them in that dream that you teach them from a young age that you too can be someone who's important. Go for it. Okay, the problem in the status quo isn't that, like this nebulous version of the American dream as being discussion, but the fact that Republicans and Democrats alike make it, make it seem as if the American dream is an inevitable thing that is existent and there are structural barriers. You can't have this false version of the So it's dream. just not true that people don't recognize that there are problems. Yes, some people don't recognize that there are problems with the way that the status quo affects individuals. Recognize this, 
that if this is your worldview and you can't recognize that there, are structure, that there is structural oppression in America and elsewhere, you're probably not going to stand up for that kind of that, like, liberal social change that they want on their side of the house either. The people who refuse to believe that there are structural inequalities that exist are not only believing that because of the American dream, rather they believe that the American dream is the underpinning behind that, that ought to be achieved, and if they can see problems in that, that's when they can start to create that kind of change. What message does it send to society? The first one we would tell you is the discourse about what change needs to occur. That a national identity about change, about, but that believes in mobility, because that is what it is. At the fundamental level, the American dream is a national identity about <coughs> mobility. And centering your society around this notion is the best way to provide individual incentives to all of the people within the society so they can push forward in their own way. That's how you kind of create, that's how you create these kinds of things when people understand that that is what we're looking for. And yes, as it comes out, we might not be the most like economically mobile system in the world. People can recognize that and recognize that what they want is not being achieved. That's when you get people making change, not when they don't think that that kind of change is possible at all or don't believe that mobility is the most important thing. And I don't think that people start all with the assumption that mobility is something that's important. We think that's something that the American dream oftentimes does uniquely give us. We'd also tell you this is something that people oftentimes, like, secondly, like, take, uh, people oftentimes take for granted that the, the, the matter, for the, no matter who you are and where you are in society part, is incredibly important towards creating a more pluralistic society. Because recognizing that no matter who you are, no matter what demographic or where you come from, you should be able to succeed means that we make it such that people have, that shouldn't be discriminated against for race, religion, sexuality, and other things, which means we do respect those kinds of differences between individuals in a pluralistic way, which is incredibly valuable to getting people to understand themselves, their cultures, and their identities much better. We'd also tell you that on the liberal side, it makes it such that people do in fact focus immensely on what happens at the bottom and how we can grant opportunity to people who are disadvantaged. But also on the conservative side, it does in fact say that people at the top in some way or some degree did in fact turn to success, which is incredibly beneficial for making it such that we have a system which does reward people at the top, not not necessarily totally disproportionately. We don't think it's true that it, like, the way to solve like economic inequality in the US is just by taxing 1% more. There just isn't enough money there. And it is, but it is in fact important that we make sure that there are incentives for people at the top that makes it such that they can in fact make the kind of change and build the kind of society they want to. That's one of the reasons we have such a, a, a burgeoning a tech economy and the reasons that people find themselves to be able to be successful in America is because they believe that if they make it to the top, they'll be rewarded. We're incredibly proud of you. Thank you. Welcome to the Second of all, people are so convinced that repetition and lack of housing use 
even in the political hemisphere uh, sphere that this is true. So I think that their uh, conception that like people have the natural ability to filter is largely compromised on their side of the house. Third, it changes the way people invest in their children. I think people care about their children, so regardless, they're going to want to provide what's best for them. But I think moreover, when you combine this poor conception of the American dream, plus some sort of generational perpetuation of this, that's when you get all those bad things I'm going to tell you right now in my constructive. So, first point, how is this bad news? I think Fred and I would largely tell you that the conversation that is happening in the political sphere regarding the American dream is just fundamentally untrue. Why? Two reasons. First of all, it's one-sided. I think it would be a little bit better if the Republicans, for example, said that the American dream was true and the Democrats were like, hey, it's not. But they don't. They both did employ this. Why? Because I think it's just like great rhetoric to be able to stand up in front of people and be like, I am a populist leader, I work for the people, I advocate for those, and I believe in a dream. Both sides are going to want to use that kind of rhetoric. No thanks. Therefore, they have the incentive to use the lie that government concedes actually exists. I think the problem with this is that it becomes an, uh, an unquestioned and painted as the reality. So everyone and the rest of the population are going to believe that this American dream exists because both sides of the house agree with this kind of conception. And like, really, when does that ever happen? Second thing is that it's just not true, right? Uh, I can take back effort. So would you rather have politicians run on a platform of not being able to achieve social mobility at all? Or would you have I think yourself? absolutely not. But I think you can not employ this kind of poor rhetoric and lie to be able to achieve those ends. I think that's fundamentally manipulative. But I think why it's not true is because this isn't like the frontier which we have wide open opportunities. I think being able to be successful relies on a few things besides just being wealthy. It relies on a lot of luck, I think. Largely, you must be exceptionally talented if you're in a poor class to be able to achieve any sort of, maybe even a chance of being able to, to achieve something better. But I think thirdly, and most importantly, is that there are structural barriers that exist that the politicians just simply don't recognize, not in the discourse. I think that's a problem. For example, racial profiling is absolutely still a big part of being able to be successful, right? When you have to work so much harder and maybe even not achieve those ends just because you are a different white race than the majority or your boss, right? I think insofar as it is a statistical near improbability that someone in the lower class can be able to achieve something greater, something that the politicians paint with their beautiful rhetoric might happen to you or probably will happen to you, is going to be a problem and that is a lie and you're not okay with that. All right, second, impacts and much. First of all, I think what it does is it encourages hard work that's going to lead to something that will never occur. So what ends up happening is individuals say, I want to be like that and I will do anything to get there because it has their I have a chance at being able to achieve that. What they end up doing is being able to be more complacent, right? They accept poorer working conditions, lower wages, maybe no benefits. They undergo more workplace abuse as a result of that because they think that this is all going to be worth it in the end, right? I think because they have this dream of bigger hope, they're more willing to put up things uh, with things now that they really shouldn't have to. I think this is especially bad because it leads to just individuals having a lower quality of life when they don't get better health care benefits when they're having to war, uh, live off a lower wage than they ought to, I think this is bad. But I think second of all, it encourages individuals uh, in this sphere to become more complacent in politics. Why? I think it's because they have this idea that one day I'm going to be rich too, so I'm going to benefit off of those policies that aren't benefiting me right now, right? What this ends up happening is a few things. First of all, you're going to be more willing to accept regressive policies. For example, you're going to be more willing to be okay with the rich being taxed less because you're going to say, one day I'm going to be in that 1%. I'm going to be able to achieve those kind of benefits, so I'm okay with that happening right now. We see that all the time. I think second all, what's going to happen is that like, you're not going to mobilize as much, right? So you're going to have less political impact as a result of this and less change that benefits you under right now the status quo, which is likely how you're going to be for the rest of your life, sadly. I think lastly what ends up happening are good things that advocate for you like unions are more likely to be challenged, uh, you're going to challenge them more because of all the things I just told you about. Last thing, how this entrenches social classes. I think Brett and I would say that the biggest irony of the American dream is that it's the biggest obstacle for it to even be true. I think the impact I just told you prove why people react the way they do. And I think this has a couple of problems when it comes to being able to achieve some sort of, uh, uh, or decreasing the, the divide between social classes. First of all, I think as a result of this, the wealthy are more likely to stay entrenched in the elites when they're consistently not being questioned, when they're consistently getting policies that benefit them most, right? Yeah. Because the poor people are more likely to support them because one day they might achieve that same thing. But I think second of all, a result of this is that you're not getting good discourse because politics are always going to stay the same. The elites are always going to re the same people because they can. And I think the lower classes are going to simultaneously also be supporting those exact same people that benefit the elites the most. So when you're able, you don't get the counterbalance you want to be able to see in discourse of politics, especially when the majority of that is being uh, is not having the, the policies that best uh, help them the most. I think then you get a very cyclical problem in this case that is very harder to break. I think the longer this kind of conception of the American dream exists, 
be harder it is to rid ourselves of the bad impacts that come about of this, right? Because we see less protections for workers because they keep decreasing. We see differences, uh, or sorry, the differences between money and politics uh, keep staying the same, or getting even, or, or, or are getting even worse, right? I think under that, to our side of the house, we're able to uh, hopefully be able to rid ourselves of that. Mr. Madam Speaker, I think because we have bad discourse, because of all the impacts on the individual, because they will never achieve the American dream, we do not stand on the lie. Very proud to. Thank you. members of the panel, from Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech to Barack Obama's Yes We Can, the American dream has been the underpinning of some of the most powerful rhetorical movements of empowerment of individuals, of the message of mobility, of the values of a nation that says we ought to create a society that allows people to succeed no matter who you are. This is the core tenet of this debate and of the rhetorical movement of the American dream. Recognize that we get a lot of analysis from opening opposition that basically says that it's only used by Republicans towards this really negative event, but then they say it's also used by Democrats, and they just say the same thing Republicans say. Recognize that like any rhetorical premise or ideological premise for a country, all political parties have a vested interest in manipulating that message towards their ends. What we're telling you is most important in this debate is we say this is the base starting point from which these political parties have debate about how to execute that end. The end is mobility regardless of who you are. They need to tell us, and we even press them for this on a POI, what the replacement for that ideology ought to be. Outside the American dream, in the power vacuum of ideology, what should we say we value as a country? Because there will always be conflicting political parties that are going to have conflicting notions. Because recognize, it's not that the Republican Party just says fuck poor people, and the Democrats say fuck poor people a little bit less. It's that they have genuinely conflicting and legitimate views about how best to advance that goal. What's important is with the American dream, that's the goal in the first place. It's not about having an aristocracy of elites that rules from the top down. It's not about any of those unfair and entrenched ideologies. So that's the burden that they have. That was like my first point about politics and the way that it interacts with these things. I think that it's hugely important that we understand that this is the base premise from which we operate on how to best execute those things. For Republicans, it might say lower tax on the wealthy to create jobs for the people at the bottom who then work themselves up. For the, uh, for the Democrats, they might say social safety nets to make sure that structural disenfranchisement doesn't mean that any student because of the color of their skin gets a worse education. Sure. Those are lively and interesting debates. And shockingly, this leads to those debates. It leads to that discourse. And we've seen that it actually creates new nuance within that discourse because recognize that when people have to come to the table from that base assumption that we want to have mobility, people like like last week, Bill O'Reilly and John Stewart came on TV and both acknowledged that white privilege exists. Like Bill O'Reilly, the Republican pundit of all time, is like, yeah, this is something that impedes, impedes against my core ideology. Because recognize that what's important is despite all of these political divides, people will usually go back to the common denominator of being an American, of eagles flying over mountains and believing that brown people will be able to succeed, not just be excluded because they're brown. That's really important, because that's how you get Bill O'Reilly to come on TV and say white privilege is a thing. It changes the minds of all of the like grandparents like mine who watch Bill O'Reilly and are like, what disenfranchisement of black people? That's how you motivate that change, because people then have that nuance around that core assumption, and that debate is the debate that happens. They need to tell us what debate they would rather be having. Sit down. Um, okay. So, moving on, next thing I want to talk to you about uh, is uh, about how this brings uh, like better immigrants into our country and creates a stronger country overall. Because I think that one of the tenets of this is also that we are welcoming to other people and welcome of people from different cultures and different backgrounds, and that we want them to come into to succeed. Recognize that there is a reason that we've seen massive influx of intelligent individuals from places like uh, India, China, various uh, parts of Asia and Europe, who have come in during the tech boom, come in during various other economic booms, and participate in the society because they do recognize, like, the American dream like a pretty good selling campaign to like smart people abroad, right? Like, if you want to get a bunch of people to like brain drain out of their countries and come make ours a good one, it's usually pretty good to tell them we've got all the like, you know, butter and honey. Like, that's great. Like, good. Get those people there. And often, those people are being able to succeed 
succeed. They are entering into the thriving economy. But I think even on the lower end, that often people are leaving countries where there is greater amounts of oppression, where you don't have a guarantee that you're going to be able to be respected because of your religion or because of your ethnicity. And then we often become a safe haven for people like that. Like recognize that like Bates is in the middle of like a place where there's a huge refugee population from Ethiopia. And recognize that there is extraordinary amounts of hard work and that people participate in like various institutions and the Free State Union that helps tutor them and raise them up because they believe that America is a place where they can succeed, whereas they would have been persecuted and executed in another country. And we think that's valuable and we think that that's a valuable thing for bringing hard workers in because we saw the immigrant populations are also what built this country and the melting pot and the American treatment was responsible for that in many ways, almost entirely. I'll take that back. So that's one impact. But when waging war, the U.S. often cites the thing the American dream as an example. Yet it then coerces poor people to fight on that behalf, promising an advancement when they often die, get maimed, or don't get advantage in the process. Isn't that unjust, self-defeating, and worse? So I think that they're going to have to do actually more to link how the American dream sends us to war. I think that that's like a bit of a leap. But insofar as we're talking about people who are lower down serving in the army, so like, first of all, the military is a huge location of mobility for individuals. And recognize that they may be buying into an area of risk. But I think that insofar as we provide that as one option of way for people to elevate themselves, they would need to tell us what the alternative of destroying that institution is and what they would rather have those people be doing, given that many people, like, like, don't just assume that people are so stupid they can't make their own adjudications on how they want to actually elevate themselves in their lives. Um, okay. Um, but lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about that. I don't think they actually address the benefits to individuals. Because we tell you, like, what do you tell to someone who is from a very impoverished part of the community or from a marginalized community? Because we are talking to a young African-American male who has every reason to believe everything is stacked against them. And they say, should I try to go to college? Should I try and be in high school? The American dream is a voice of optimism and a voice of support that says your nation is behind you and trying to pursue being a better person, rather than a fatalistic one that says you should simply give up because the society is failing you and you should fail them. And recognize that I don't think that they grapple with how this does agitate people for individualistic change. They were just like, no, the American dream just blinds us all completely into not seeing when we're getting screwed. And it's just too late. Like, people don't wake up when they're 80 and be like, God, I never got that house in the Hamptons. Like, people are mad now. People are tired now. People are in the streets now. This is what we're talking about. And this is the agitation that we get. So now, a bit of explicit refugee. So the first thing they talk, uh, they uh, like talk about is like if it's, uh, they're like they tell us it's a lie. We say if it's a lie, we think often actually this isn't a lie. But so they have to actually grapple with that. People can't escalate themselves. They say like working hard. Uh, we tell you that working hard is always a benefit. And they're like no, because then you're like working hard and you're sad. They still haven't told us why working hard is bad. Like we would prefer that people would be working hard because you do get benefits from it. Like you at least have more money. Like you have a sense of purpose. You don't feel like completely like lost in this. Like you're going to have to work hard to survive either way. You might as well feel good about it. Um, so I think that. Then they like talk uh, the back half. We get like, isn't it bad that the burdens on the individual to raise themselves up? Is that what Barack is come, bad? Barack Obama is coming out and saying like, hey guys, we need to like talk about how you guys aren't working hard enough. <laughs> no, he's saying the American dream is failing you. We need to reconstruct a society that does allow you to succeed, regardless of these differences. Um, they talk about how, uh, uh, oh sorry, uh, they talk about like uh, the, the discourse that this is untrue, like, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the impacts that the hard work for something will never occur, like sometimes it does occur, like there are many stories of success in this country, this is a huge erasure of the success of immigrant communities, of people who did come to this country and elevated themselves. I'm guessing a lot of you are in this room and your parents are, uh, were the people that did this, and I think that that's something that's worth talking about, that's something that the American Dream supports, and we're proud to propose. finally admitted, after about 17 infuriating interviews of denial about white privilege, that that actually existed. What was his response to white privilege and the response of a large majority of Republicans to the existence of that policy? Yes, I mean, not policy, it's not policy, that's stupid. Anyway, uh, yeah, so his response was, that might be the case, it might be hard, it might be tough, those structural barriers might exist, but man could, we're good at hard work and, uh, and stick to it in this, will get you through that. That's the part of the case that side opposition brings to you that Taylor jokes away and never engages in it. Because it's not fair for them to just simply say there's going to be agitation and that people are going to act now. Because Katrina tells you specific reasons why economic incentives that they think that they will get later on will keep them muted now, that will keep them from not acting now. It would have been great to have some engagement from that on first gov. I'm sure we'll get it from the second gov. We'll see. Okay, reputation. Five points from what we get from the first gov team. First of all, we hear that the message that hard work and persistence often pays off 
even if not perfect, encourages behavior that is beneficial regardless. Like what possibly could go bad from doing a little bit of hard work? Two responses. First of all, I'd suggest that this toxic discourse dis disappearance would not mean that people would stop trying to maximize their chances. It's not like that in Canada and the United Kingdom that people all of a sudden don't see the benefits of hard work. The thing is, is that they say that we are having, we, we have to work hard, but there are barriers to that hard work that might make it so that that never occurs. I think there's the example of someone who decides if I work in a factory now, and if I keep my savings, maybe one day I can be Herman Cain and be the CEO of Godfather. That's the type of thing that I think people end up thinking. Then they start realizing after 10 to 15 years that I can't save that much money, that oh man, the electricity bill is high, that shit Verizon screws me on all of my bills. That's the end of what ends up being the problem. And people have these impacts occurring and cyclically continuing over all of this time, and they don't actually get the chance to be agitated like Taylor suggests they will until shit is too, it's gone wrong and they're not going to be as activated. I'd suggest that we want people active, uh, in, in being mobily active for themselves, not just after they've realized that things are a lie, but from the get-go. That's a problem for them. Secondly, that they say that there will always be conflicting parties and discourse that seek to ensure the American dream is achieved. But the problem with the American dream and the belief that hard work and persistence can pay off is that it necessarily distorts all other discourse. It's very difficult for politicians to engage with the idea that if you are super hardworking and that if you keep to it, that there is going to be, that like, that that's not going to make you more successful. Everyone intuitively wants to believe that, right? Everyone wants to believe that if they try really hard, that other things won't matter, which means that that conception is going to be so much more prevalent. It's not so easy for Barack Obama to say then that we are going to challenge things in the same way. That makes this discourse super problematic. I'd also suggest to you that the, the more, like, the, there's a reason then that they're, uh, yeah, go ahead, actually. It's not just first immigration, first generation immigrants, but everybody and every poor person in the United States who has to pay electricity bills. But many of them do end up finding savings and getting their kids a better life. Why isn't that a good message to advocate? Because what ends up being advocated, what ends up being put in, instilled in people is that if you are a rich person and you work hard, and you are a poor person and you work hard, that you have similar levels of success. But what Katrina tells you is that if you are a poor, poor person and you you are going to be successful largely in only a couple of situations. If you are transcendently talented, if you work like incredibly hard, whereas if I'm an average person born to a rich family, I can achieve probably similar things to that individual. I think that that's the problem with the discourse, and that's why you end up getting that. Republicans love to hold up the picture of the person that transcended and that came from the bottom. But the problem is, is that nobody else is holding up the 20 other pictures of the people that just got too uh, object and got too depressed about things and didn't want to continue. Not everyone can persevere and work hard through that. Third, they tell you that great thing that, uh, that it's a great thing to bring people here and have uh, and encourage people. And this is a safe haven for success. And that why would it be bad to get people from India to come to the United States and be able to share that dream? I suggest to you that me and Katrina would have far preferred if those people had not chosen to go to the United States and stake their fortunes, but to another Western liberal democracy where those structural barriers were less enforced, where those structural barriers were more accessible, and they didn't necessarily have to be driving a cab in New York as opposed to being able to get to add more easier access to work in Toronto. I don't think that they can just say, we got people out, when there's a comparative as to where other people might have gone, right? That's a problem for them. Fourth, they say, what is your alternative? It's not just your burden in this round to tell us why the discourse is bad. You have to give us another world. Well, I'd suggest to you that the other world is literally all the other frigging countries in the world that are America, right? The only other countries in the world that don't pursue the American dream. I think it's reasonable for us Public it's reasonable for us to uh, think that these types of situations can occur. I don't think it's. I don't think on side opposition we're suggesting we don't have a discussion about structural barriers. But this type of belief, this American dream ideology, makes that discussion necessarily impossible. Okay. And then they la and lastly they say that it gives support to individuals and hope, and we get uh, and that th this hope is net beneficial even if you don't believe the other stuff that they say. But I think that that hope necessarily changes the way that people act. And this is where I'm going to get into the building, but first I'll take Taylor. So it doesn't tell you that it's going to be, you're going to be wealthy. It tells you you can improve your circumstances, which is a powerful aspirational message. Why do you think poor people are so stupid they can't understand what that means? Okay, so if you're going to improve your circumstance, you are probably going to get wealthier. I think that's a logical link for people to draw. Necessarily people don't think, well maybe I'll go from 30k to 50k. They think I'm going to be like all the 1% the, the that everyone wants to be like, right? When I think of self-improvement, I don't think I'll probably go from my retail job at Walmart to the retail 
job at Target, which is a managerial position. I think I'm going to be a lawyer, which is probably unrealistic. My grades aren't very good. I don't think that's how people actually think. But what does Katrina tell you specifically? She tells you that this encourages the way that people act politically and the impacts that necessarily occur. Because I think that people are less likely to mobilize for their own specific interests when they think that there is long-term gains that could be wrought, right? When you think that in the long term that you might be someone who is rich, that those, that those policies might benefit you, that you might even be marginally more wealthy, that necessarily leads individuals to not advocate for certain policies that would benefit them or people like them. That means that you have less ability for social mobility to, uh, be, uh, to, be, to become more strengthened and that you get more uh, and you get less wealth and equality. The reason for that is because you don't have these types of individuals being accessed by these parties. At the end of the day, Madam Speaker, we believe that this dream, while a good thing in, in, in theory, ends up distorting the, the, the uh, ends up distorting the conversation in a way that necessarily makes people make bad decisions and that makes individuals uh, have worse lives in many in many ways. We are proud to. work to break down the borders between them, to invite in new citizens, and to empower individuals with the choice of where to live, where to work, and where to raise their children, the world becomes a better place for everyone. And in particular, I'm going to focus on this speech and why it becomes a much better place for everyone living within the borders of the United States of America. Three major issues that I want to talk about. Why the American dream is alive and well, that will thought directly go opening opposition. Secondly, this issue of exploitation and political discourse, also directly clashing with them. And thirdly, more on exactly the ways in which immigration has actually improved the United States for immigrants and non-immigrants alike. Before that, one quick bit of rebuttal. Now, Brent says in the last speech, if you're rich or poor, the American dream says you'll have similar outcomes in your life overall, because everyone believes they're going to be Bill Gates. I think this is a preposterous straw man of the way that the American dream is actually conceptualized. Points out in her POI, the American dream says you will do better, not that you will do the absolute best. That's not just the info slide, it's also the reality. People coming from situations of poverty do not imagine themselves as being fabulously wealthy. They imagine themselves trying to build up a marginally better life than they had before because they are so used to not having that type of mobility at all. Any additional mobility in that case is in fact the incentive that becomes salient to those individuals, to immigrants who come to the United States, and that's what they conceptualize. It's hugely patronizing to, tell, to imply that everybody coming to the United States has this totally irrational understanding of the way that the economy works or the way that their mobility might work. So, first major thing, why the American dream is alive and well. We tell you that this has to be a comparative debate. And in the United States, you actually generally have more class mobility, especially as a minority ethnicity immigrant, than anywhere else in the world, including, I'm going to take the hard case, their favorite, like, Western liberal democracies. Maybe not Canada, I don't know, but like, I think Canada is going to apply here as well. There are three major reasons for this. In other liberal countries like France, Britain, and Canada, there are three major issues that don't exist in the United States. Firstly, especially when you're young, it's much harder to get a job because the government enforces rigid labor, market, uh, labor markets. Like you have to give much more, you have to give much more warning before you let somebody off on leave, or you have to give much higher benefits, or they have other incentives to keep employees around for a very, very long time. That means you have much less labor market turnover, and as a young person coming out of college or any other education system, you have a much harder time getting a job. That's why in France, the unemployment rate for young college graduates is, graduates is around 20%, and the U.S. is around 5% right now. That's, it gives, actually gives people the opportunity to make this better life for themselves once they've come and gotten a better education. And it's also, by the way, not dramatically easier to get high-paying work in Toronto than it is in New York. I'm pretty sure that a lot of immigrants in Toronto also end up driving taxi cabs. Secondly, we tell you it's harder to gain social mobility in these other countries because they were often founded, maybe not Canada specifically, but most other Western liberal democracies, on rigid class systems, right? So there's a great example of this. You can look at like the public school Oxbridge uh, system that exists in the UK right now. Basically, like if you go to a really prestigious private school prior to going to the college, you're almost you're most likely to get into Oxford or Cambridge. And two-thirds of cabinet members in the UK parliament are graduates from Oxford and Cambridge. The result of this is a massively existingly privileged class is given access to the reins of political power. In the United States, that's much less the case because we have a much more egalitarian education system, even if it does have some flaws, and much less a more egalitarian access to high-profile institutions via scholarships and attempts at affirmative action. Finally, we tell you that in these other countries, which are often smaller than the past have attracted smaller immigrant communities, there's less ethnic diversity within the country, and therefore fewer support structures for new immigrant groups from within their own community. 
But most cases, keep in mind, are actually far worse than this. Most people are immigrating from Mexico, from Cuba, from India, from Indonesia, countries that have much less infrastructure than here. So maybe the fact of the matter is, other liberal democracies like Canada should have some, their equivalent of the American dream, not that we should abandon that narrative altogether in favor of screwing over other people. The United States has benefits of a more egalitarian general education system. For example, now under Obama and his executive order, children brought by their parents to the United States, even illegally, have guaranteed access to public education in the United States, a right that is not typical in Western liberal democracies right now. And we also have a more flexible labor market for the reasons that I've, that I've explained. That's why over half of Americans experience upward mobile class, class mobility during their lives, even if it's not all the way to the very top. Secondly, on this issue of exploitation and political discourse. We tell you that this is a radically non-comparative issue on their side of the house, at least the way they present it. Because we tell you that there are two cases here. Either they're talking about people who are already in the United States and experiencing the way that the American dream plays out. In which case, those people do not, without the American dream, and they vote in the sense phrase, have the economic or social capital to create meaningful political change within the country. The American dream is actually why we get the critical mass to make that change. And a great example of this is going to be like the agricultural labor union movement in the Southwest in the 1950s and 60s, and various other labor market labor union movements in the 1940s and 50s. Because once you have the American dream narrative drawing people to an area and location, you get lots of people with similar interest and employment in one place and in one industry, which actually gives them the critical mass to demand change on a mass scale. But it also gets them the material wealth to organize. Because most of these people, even if they're taking low paying jobs, even if they don't have the best working conditions, actually do end up with more wealth and more le leisure time than they would have had in this, uh, prior to coming to the United States, because they have the ability to actually get that organization out there. Also, we can tell you that these workers are not like they claim totally exploited. The United States, in fact, does have like basic protections, like safety laws for labor work for laborers and minimum wage that do allow this mobility to occur. OO claims that these are going to accept regressive policies, but what we tell you is that, on the contrary, the American dream was the rallying cry of these movements. Now the other situation is that people aren't already in the U.S., in which case we want to give people a reason to come here and create this benefit in the first place from. So give me a reason why these types of movements that people brought to try and get themselves better, uh, better results, like these ag agricultural things that you mentioned, wouldn't have been achieved in, in the absence of the American dream. Right. Firstly, we told you that the narrative is what draws people into the place in the first place, right? Like most of people coming from across the Mexican border into the United States right now are seeking better working conditions because it's something that we promise and tout on an international scale, right? That's what allows us to get this critical mass in that allows for these, this organization to happen. Finally, we tell you under this that this is, the American dream is a way that we actually do hold politicians to account. Firstly, because we get like Democrats and Obama saying, look, the government has an obligation to help you satisfy the American dream. Like when he says, if you built a big corporation, you didn't build that, we all built that, right? That got some pushback, but that was the discourse. And by the way, Obama won that election because Americans do care about governments supporting this. This, it insists that people get credit for their achievements once they have them, so that once immigrants are successful, we give them credit for that work, which opening opposition doesn't seem to want to do. Finally, I want to talk a little bit more about how immigration is good for everyone, because we get hard workers, and we do get, by the way, the rare geniuses. Historically, for example, Scots, Irish, and German immigrants in the Midwest built up most of our industrial base, which led to economic growth and the development of the country overall. Albert Einstein was a German Jew who could more than almost anybody to the development of nuclear technologies that are useful in medical research and energy, and also to physics and academia generally. And right now, we tell you that dreamers from Latin America are coming to get education under Obama's executive order that's developing cross-cultural interchange and evolution, including things like rich cultures like Tex-Mex, California Mex, and Southwestern Mex, and the impact of, similar to this of South Korean, Vietnamese, and Japanese immigrants in Hawaii and the West Coast. This leads to technological innovation as well as immigration genius. So Mr. Mayor is a great example, a second-generation Latin American woman who grew up in poverty and is now in the Supreme Court. Because immigration is good for everybody in the United States particularly, we're happy to promote it. about whether Obama won the election. This is a debate about why he won the election, and until government shows that the American dream and the rhetoric affiliated with that was the causation for Obama winning the debate, and simultaneously the causation for people like Bill O'Reilly actually changing the mindsets that they have, they don't demonstrate that this is actually the meaningful tipping point for how people perceive of people of the lower class. It's not enough to merely say that this is intertwined with issues of mobility that exist in the status quo and are causing progress. It is the burden of 
government to demonstrate that this is the catalyst for progress that led Obama to be elected and that led Bill O'Reilly to finally become one iota less racist. The only way that they think they can show this within the context of the round is the counter-narrative that emerges in response to the narrative that is championed by the majority of Americans surrounding the American dream, and that is the oppressive one. Why is the majority opinion the oppressive one, and why is the counter-narrative so ineffective? First, we see the corporatization and the influence of the market upon the dominant narrative. Why is this uniquely important? We see companies like Ford integrating the notions of the American dream and what it means to be rising through and what it means to be working class American upon the people, which basically fetishizes the idea and establishes that the working class poor can basically be Ford American. But simultaneously and secondarily, we also think it's been enshrined as a part of the American tradition. We think it's become hard to speak out against the American creed and simultaneously against the American dream because it's seen as counter-nationalist and it has a chilling effect on speech in circumstances where people would have been Bill O'Reilly's and been one iota less racist, but are now afraid of how people will perceive them when they try to challenge notions that are fundamental to our American identity, leading them to no longer make these statements and leading them to not even internally challenge notions about what it means to actually, truly be mobile. That's why the counter-narrative fails. Simultaneously, the counter-narrative fails because the people that are making the counter-narratives are not the ones with political success in society or the means to actually make meaningful speech acts that people will perceive as actual. I'll take it. So the debate happens around the American dream, and that's good. Why do you want more people to criticize a creed of mobility? Because you're not getting mobility through the American dream. You should probably criticize it. We think that if you're telling people you can be mobile and creating a false sense of solvency, you get less advocacy, as opening opposition said, for things like unions, but secondarily, it's victim blaming, as we very clearly pointed out, in situations where individuals don't actually understand what is the causation, and people focus on equality of opportunity instead of equality that is fundamental and not centered on wealth, meaning people focus on the idea of having equal opportunities regardless of the alternative variables, whereas our side says, maybe that's not the right way to go about this, maybe we should say that we should focus on the structures, not merely providing people opportunities within these structures that render it impossible to actually use the opportunities. Three points of substantive demarcation. First, I'm going to say how and why it's always abusive, then how we perceive of mobility as a result, and then how this creates and re-entrenches cycles of oppression. So first and foremost, why it's always abusive. We've heard base-level rhetoric about how rhetoric is bad and how rhetoric is coercive, but as we all know, rhetoric exists throughout all parts of society. Taylor, this is true for you. You don't say why it's unique rhetoric, nor does opening office. The reason this is so particularly unique rhetoric is the same reason that it has become entrenched as part of the American tradition. It has become linked with our fundamental legal history and with our nationalist identity that we are a working people that are going to strive hard and focus on actually challenging the oppressors that are external states and saying we are the best. We think this is part of the American we are the best narrative that leads to us being one, materialist, but two, materialism leading to imperialism where our own sense of us succeeding wealth-wise and in terms of our material possessions leads us to believe we have some degree of entitlement towards these sorts of things. Secondarily, there's the same argument about fetishization. We think that people are afraid to challenge these notions and don't even challenge them internally because they take them as fundamental truths to who they are as citizens. We don't think you get people actually thinking about why Obama said that that was a part of the American dream. We think they vote for Obama for other reasons. We don't think that they got it. Finally, we think that there just aren't debates about fundamental principles. I think that the reason that this debate is so interesting in the debate context is because people like Rand Paul don't bring up how libertarianism interacts with concepts of mobility in the American dream. I think that notions like this don't get interacted with because the fundamental cores are so entrenched that you have to interact on higher level political debates, meaning that people don't even talk about what mobility should be. It's just presumed to be the status quo bias that mobility is people working hard within these structures rather than challenging. Then let's talk about how we perceive mobility. Open government says this is a debate about ideology and what we value. So remember that we have to consider how these values are portrayed and actually internalized. We'd say even if you say that you're prioritizing equality, we'd say that you're prioritizing <coughs> equality of opportunity over equality of circumstances. The reason this is relevant is because individuals prioritize the ability to work hard in the circumstances they are given. But we think that the reason this is problematic is because that's not a meaningful way out. We get a few narratives out of closing government that people sometimes are the rich individuals that are able to work themselves out. What we don't hear is that this is the majority that the American dream was the reason they were able to succeed. They give this example like in the 40s and 50s there was a gold rush and the American dream contributed to this. I don't think this means that the United States rallies around the American dream leading to economic progression. I think there was a 
gold rush and people wanted money. I think what they actually need to do to demonstrate that this is some meaningful tipping point in terms of how we advance and conceptualize ourselves, they need to show that this is actually developing over time, and I don't think they do. Finally, on how this recreates and entrenches the settlers. So the American dream, as opening government said, is a rallying cry. The problem is this re-entrenches notions concerning wealth as quality of life. Why is this problematic? We'd say one, it leads to materialism, but secondarily, stigmatization of individuals that actually can achieve this wealth within these contexts, and it actually leads to circumstances where individuals are viewed as the lesser, meaning they're not granted equality of opportunity in the first place because they're not perceived as the same citizens that are actually trying just as hard, because clearly if they were trying just as hard, the American dream would reward them with the wealth that CG says that it truly does. This is an aberration. It simply doesn't. Now let's go to strike education. Opening government says that this rhetoric is powerful, better for workers, because it presents a counter-narrative. One, why is this counter-narrative successfully able to challenge the dominant narrative that is entrenched by 300 years of American history, 300 years of nationalist intentions, and a very nationalist culture, but three, the pop culture notion that this is just something we're supposed to accept and cherish, and something that we should all agree upon as Americans. We think that people are afraid to challenge notions for that reason, meaning it's not better for workers. You're seen as anti-American. You're seen as just a Marxist when you try to challenge the American dream. And we think that that sort of stigmatization means that no meaningful change actually ever happens. Next, they say, we don't make these sorts of changes, meaning that we actually get to political change. I don't think they actually demonstrated why political change happens. Closing government tries to present the standard that there are certain unique reasons as to why we get better situations for workers. They talked about individual situations where major issues change, and they actually got better youth employment. They don't say why perceptions concerning the American dream actually generated these changes within youth employment. I think youth employment changes when people actually recognize economic benefits to everybody, not just recognizes that our opportunities are important. racism and the like, that change can occur, that we can deserve better, that we can demand better, and we deserve to be continuously working for change and holding our politicians accountable towards achieving that change for us. We've brought you in this debate three things. First of all, the idea that the American dream does allow us to act to break down entrenched privileges, i.e. challenging the system that back opposition desires. Secondly, we bring you the comparative to circumstances in other countries and how just because not every single American achieves Bill Gates level success, you are still more likely to get it here than you are almost anywhere else. And thirdly, we say that the American dream creates progress economically that benefits the entire nation, even those who don't achieve the sort of like material success that they were expecting. We still say that it's better than the alternative. So first, on how we break down entrenched privilege and challenge these sorts of power structures. Challenging this idea of the corporate capitalist control is something that is fueled by the narrative of the American dream. Because we understand that it's not fair that individuals, because of differences in the way that in the circumstances of their birth, gave them access to this wealth, we recognize that injustice. It's ingrained within the American ethos, within each American citizen, to identify that as something that is not fair. We say that individual citizens are not unaware that the status quo is biased against them and they're, they're not internally challenging these norms like back opposition claims. We tell you that the call for regulation of bankers is rooted in the American dream narrative that people should be playing by the same rules, that everyone should have the same ability to succeed, that no group should be advantaged over another group, and we get the breakdown of those sorts of structures on our side of the house. We also tell you that it's politically useful shorthand to explain how things ought to be. For some reason, they want us to literally prove to you that the American dream got Obama elected. <laughs> Bizarrely, we can do that because Obama was elected on the margins by immigrants and minority populations who turned out to vote in droves for him because he promised them change they couldn't believe in. Like, look, the literal link is to the American dream. It's great. Like, the, the example that they tried, it's great. The example that they tried to debate was like, they're like, well, you create this 
idea that there's metaphorical gold in the mountains, and that people are going to rush through that and pan for gold unsuccessfully. Like, I'm going to assume that was a metaphor. Um, so we tell you what we were actually talking about is how the success of the labor unions in the 40s and 50s actually achieved things like the existence of the weekend or an eight-hour workday, because the American dream allows us to flag when things are unfair. We tell you, and this goes unaddressed, that it gives you the wealth and critical mass to organize, the drive to organize, and the ability to know that when you do that, you can create substantive change. And we tell you that we have seen that change in challenging these structures. But even if, right, it's not a perfect system in America, we tell you that it's comparatively better to circumstances in other countries. And then we get this like nice Marxist critique that it's fetishization of material wealth and that's a problem. Wealth isn't measured any differently in Britain. You just can't get it if you're an immigrant. Uh, so we tell you that the comparative here is incredibly important. Because first of all, we tell you we have a system in which individuals are able to start working for their success, planning for their success at a young age, building these skills and attitudes to keep moving forward. We haven't gotten any argumentation out of the offense as to why hard work is a bad thing. We tell you that even if you don't achieve the level of success you are expecting, you build skills, you plan for the future, and your children will do better than you. You believe that and you expect it, you plan for it. We tell you also that we're different from other countries and that we literally aren't founded on an explicit class system that entrenches these sorts of norms like the Oxford funneling system into parliament. Right. But the problem is, is that when part of the American dream is founded on the idea that hard work and persistence can overcome, the idea will always be that, if, that these structural barriers aren't that important because if you were a harder worker, if you were more persistent, that can be eliminated. So it's the idea that you're suggesting is that there is no way to end sexism. There is no way to defeat racism. There is no way individuals can overcome that. We think that that's the alternative ethos, is one that when you face problems, you're in a country where that's just never going to change. You're in a system, you're locked into your position, and you just have to accept that because society and the status quo is disadvantaging you, that it will continue to disadvantage you, and that there is nothing that you as an individual can do to ever change your circumstances. We say that telling people that there is hope isn't a bad thing. A little more more piece of analysis on other countries. We tell you that there's less ethnic diversity and support structures when you're not drawing these individuals in. Europeans hate immigrants at a literal Nazi level right now. We say that even if there's some opposition to immigrants, we tell you that first of all, we have executive orders like the DREAM Act, which allows them access to education. But secondly, uh, they've been able to thrive in the past. No thank you. But lastly, we bring you that it creates progress that economically advantages the entire nation. We tell you that this comes in a variety of ways. First of all, through the sort of through brain drain from other countries, when people realize that the material conditions and the structural circumstances in the countries where they live are such that they will not be able to achieve success. They come to America where we've already proven you are likely to be better off, even if you are not at the top echelons of society. So we tell you that that gives an incentive for individuals, not only the elite intelligentsia to come in and build up the highest echelons of American technology and infrastructure and science and medicine, and we get all of those people who would prefer to build a life here than elsewhere, which benefits literally any citizen who ever gets access to the products that they make, which are all manufacturing, all medicine is founded on, as Griffin told you, the immigrants who came to our country and built it up from where it is to a place where it is, from where it was to where it is now. We tell you that America creates a cultural Mexican melting pot, unlike the what's called in France the salad, where you're just sort of tossed in and there's really no help for you or no, and no way to feel like you're a part of the whole. We say that the American dream allows individuals to feel like they are a part of something bigger, a part of something bigger with the ability to demand that their material conditions ought to be better. Demand it and work for it. We tell you that this allows people to feel empowered within their own scenarios, regardless of what those scenarios may be. Because while we acknowledge structural oppression on side government, we tell you that it is useless to believe that it can never be overcome by individuals. We are proud to promote.
Thanks a lot, Madam Speaker. It's true. Martin Luther King once talked about having a dream. Langston Hughes talked about a dream deferred. It's easy in this round for both sides to throw claims and impacts at each other about ways in which the U.S. might be comparatively better or worse than other countries. True. In some ways it's better. In some ways it's worse. The way this debate needs to be adjudicated is upon the links to how this particular rhetorical tool actually achieves impacts in individuals' lives and the political system. That's what Michael and I have done in this round. That's what opposition is winning this round on. And in this whip speech, I'm going to go through the round and dissect it according to that paradigm and show you why it flows to our side. Remember, just tokenizing Obama and Sotomayor or essentializing groups of immigrants and saying that they make good contributions doesn't prove that the American dream was the reason. And if it was, that it's still good now and that it wasn't worth the cost. I think that they didn't do sufficient advocacy on their side to substantiate those benefits. It's damning. I want to start out by asking, how are individuals actively affected? We hear out of opening government the idea that hard work might not always be sufficient, but it certainly pays off. And people can understand the nuance, right? They don't expect to be Bill Gates, but they just want to prove themselves a little better. This might be true to an extent, but also recognize that a lot of people either blame themselves or are blamed by others when they don't succeed because they can then be told or tell themselves that they didn't work hard enough, that they didn't do enough to fix their own problems. And that not only puts the burden on the oppressed to fix the conditions of oppression, something we've told you from the beginning of the round that we think is unjustified and stupid, but what it also does is just accept those people that would probably naturally succeed anyway, give us a cool reason that gives us all credit for it as part of our nationalism, and then be able to ignore those other people who don't and say, well, they could always work harder, or hey, their condition is probably marginally better than it would be. But even if that weren't the case, look at what the MG says. Because we hear this idea that Scotch-Irish immigrants were able to achieve really well, and hey, well-educated Asian workers were able to succeed in America. Do you know why they succeeded? Because there was demand for those individuals, as Michael explained, and they had actual skills thought in any country, in Britain or wherever, would have been put to work because of economic and market conditions that existed. They did not succeed because there was a rhetoric saying that, oh, as long as they come and try, therefore they're going to be integrated. I'll take you later. I don't think that the actual American dream ethos here is was able to achieve this. As Michael told you, opportunity, equal equality of opportunity is not only not real, but is insufficient, right? That's what they advocate for on their side of the house. As long as people have basic equal opportunities to be able to work hard, therefore they'll be able to achieve. This just isn't true. Why? Because even if two people start a race at the same time, if one starts 30 yards behind the other one, structurally, they're unable to keep up. That's the nuance that their side of the house misses out on. Just because two people or people from two groups work equally hard and might both move a little bit forward, that doesn't mean they're moving sufficiently far forward for us to consider this being good or justified. And it also doesn't mean, I'll take you later, that we're actually seeing the benefits that we need to. I think we've shown you that there's actual problematic impacts. I want to tell you what they are and how they outweigh what we hear out of them. So let's let's look at some of those impacts. So, so first sure back. Okay, cool. So you, I agree that it's nice in principle to have like critical discourse about capitalistic notions of success. How do you guys on your side of the house actually get the critical mass to politically enact those critiques in a meaningful or efficacious way? Right, so what we would say is that even if we don't have perfect solvency, there's a hindrance, an active hindrance to it on their side of the house. That is, our opening side tells you empirically we have seen many improvements in other liberal democracies in which ways in which lives are better for people. I know everyone likes to talk about lots of ways that life is better in the U.S., about how we don't have the Oxford system, about how people have different types of opportunities. But it just got empirically true that being poor in America is the best place to be poor, or if it is, that it's for all people, and that if that's the case, it's because of the American dream. There are just so many links on this side of the house that aren't reached and that just are hinted at, and I want to actually link now to our impacts and show you why those are bad and why they're more important. First one is the military POI, I ask. Here's a tangible example of why the American dream sucks. So the U.S. does often go wage wars based on the American dream because we say our national creed is being offended here, American values are at stake. They say it's good to make the fundamental American value be that hard work is at stake here. What does that mean? That means that poor people then go volunteer or coerce to fight in the military, both because they're American creed and fundamental values, and if they want to be a patriot, if they want to be a dreamer and be an American, tell them to. But even though that's not the case, just for economic mobility and opportunity, go fight anyway. And they often do die, and they often do get injured, and they often do get PTSD, they often do end up homeless. Fine, maybe the military is for some people a good source of social mobility. It would be on both sides of the house. But as Michael tells you, look at the reasons why people do these things and ask, are they making meaningful consent and are they substantially better off? We tell you they're not substantially better off, and even if they're somewhat better off, they can't meaningfully consent into the system that often dupes and tricks them and is subverted by wealthy, privileged powers. That's problematic, and we don't think that's good. Let's say that word's sufficient. What else? First, Taylor. 
So, Op claims that it's toxic to tell people hard work will advance your place in society. Your alternatives are telling them to depend on a state that will likely fail them and has already marginalized them, or absolute fatalism. What would you tell people that want to improve this? I love the false dichotomy. It's like, tell people to work hard or tell them they're fucked relying on the state. No, how would I have a nuanced thing that says people should work hard, also the state has responsibilities, also recognize that not everyone can work hard, and that not everyone working hard is going to work. Not their side of the house. We don't say the American dream in no cases has any validity, we say that as it exists as an institution, it should be regretted. That's the distinction that's around. Okay, we hear all them again, the hard work is about that. Let's talk about why that's pernicious as an impact for other individuals. So what it does is, first of all, it uniquely targets some people. Here's an example. My dad used to work in the welfare offices before they had computers figured out. You would sit down with them and he would tell you whether or not you got welfare. Then there's the movement about work for welfare. People should work hard to get money. Here's what he says, the problem with that. A lot of people just can't work hard. Why? They're single parents. They don't have education. They have mental illness. They're substantively abusing drugs. All these other things. Most people, for structural reasons, who are not succeeding, are not succeeding for certain reasons that make it difficult for them to work hard under the dominant narratives that they need to defend on their side of the house. The whitewashed mainstream dominant narratives But what it means to work hard and how you should do that. That means people who most benefit, according to them, from the American dream, have the least likelihood of being able to integrate themselves into those actual jobs and those actual mechanisms. That's why they get blamed a lot of the time when they don't actually succeed. And that's why people say, oh, they're reliant on the state. No, it's not a dichotomy. They're neither totally reliant on the state, nor should they just be working harder. It's a complicated mix. And their side of doesn't achieve that. Other countries, comparatively at least, better seem to have this understanding. And I don't think empirically we can buy a law of what comes out of the MG just as to why these trade unions are, one, the only way these uh, benefits have occurred, and two, as to why they like the American dream. But let's talk about immigration, because they seem to like immigration a lot on their side of the house. Who comes mostly as immigrants? People who have skills or are able to succeed in the market, or people who come from Latin America who come because the U.S. is the most proximate country, not because they prefer to the U.K. or they prefer to France, because it's a whole lot easier to get here, right? I don't think the American dream is uniquely bringing in these immigrant populations or doing good things to them when they come. Look, there's a huge trade-off that Michael explains. It becomes difficult to critique not just the American dream, but poverty itself. When we say the American dream is a critical part of American values, and anything that kind of gets near that is seen as being anti-American. That makes it harder to get real pragmatic policy solutions. That's why people are worse off, and that's why we're proud to oppose.